My name is Jay Heap. I'm with the Georgia Virtual School. I'm the Associate Director of Operations. And with me today is our State Director of um, Distant uh, Virtual Learning. I keep forgetting that. Uh, Dr. Christina Clayton and our Manager of Instructional Development, Tammy Eckert. And probably uh, most of what we're going to show, I give you a little history of what Georgia Virtual School is and does and where we were, <coughs> and then spend some time talking about uh, where we're going and, and why. So, uh, yes, the topic is we are making the move to uh, open educational resources, but I think part of the interest is the journey that we've, we've gone to, to getting there. So Georgia Virtual School actually has three programs, uh, <clears throat> and, and we'll look through those. Uh, we have Georgia Virtual School, and that is a a program that started back in 2005 uh, <clears throat> through a governor's uh, line item in, in the budget. We uh, serve courses to students in nine, uh, ninth through 12th grade, uh, four credit students throughout the state. We serve public, private, and homeschool students. We are SACS accredited and NCAA accredited courses. We do offer middle school courses uh, in a summer program. We also have uh, 5,200 uh, enrollments this semester, and that's not 5,200 students, but that's 5,200 half-unit courses being taught. Uh, we offer over 20 AP courses in six world languages. Uh, part of the, uh, also part of what we do with Georgia Virtual Learning uh, is have uh, Georgia Credit Recovery. And this started in 2007, uh, to fill a need of our uh, students in our state who needed to recover credit. Uh, there are 18 teacherless self-paced courses uh, and they're free to all Georgia public school students. So that's another piece that we did. And then we also have uh, Georgia Virtual Learning that, that we established last February as kind of an umbrella. We had trouble with uh, people trying to figure out where to go, whether they were credit recovery, whether they were virtual learning, and we needed an umbrella organization to kind of uh, direct people and provide some stability for uh, the programs overall. So uh, one of the things that we started with was a, with Georgia Virtual Learning, was a blended learning program. Uh, and we started, my slide ran off, and we, we're running a pilot right now this year <coughs> with about eight schools, about 1,500 students in different blended learning models, and we will carry that pilot over. The other thing that uh, Georgia Virtual Learning is, is doing is taking us into the uh, open education area uh, for uh, fall of 2012, and then we also have a program called eSource that provides material to our students. So we're going to take a look at some of those here in a second. But I just need to get a little bit of history of what was going on. So we started with Georgia Virtual School having courses and tried to find a way to get this material out to our students. And so right now we have 24 shared courses that you can get to at Georgia Virtual Learning. They are not all open educational resources, but they are available for anybody who, who accesses those. And these, these are the 24 courses here, I'll leave them up there for a second because I know a lot of times people show this slide, it takes too long, and uh, so you can look in. We offer, most of them right now are core courses. Um, our middle school summer program courses are also in the list. Um, those are courses that are generally a, a the whole year's worth of material taught in six weeks, so it's very fast paced. The design uh, originally was for uh, middle school students who needed to move to this seventh or eighth grade but didn't complete the material. They could go back in and, and take this course. So uh, those are what, what are available now. So how did the, the whole OER in Georgia virtual learning where are we and why did we choose to go this way? And that, I guess, is really the, the crux of, of what we're here to talk about. We had some issues and, and concerns 
We've been around since 2005. We develop all of our own material. We, we buy very little material. Most of the material that we have is created by uh, Tammy's team through uh, contracted adjunct instructors or, or subject matter experts. Uh, we build almost all of our courses exclusively to be textbookless, which is a, a, a challenge to, to build something without a textbook or resources, but somewhat also very easy to make it then uh, shareable. Um, we, we generally use teacher created or public domain resources now. Not all of them are OER. Some were used with the fair use policy. Some are used, were used with uh, the TEACH Act. Um, we have content in, in Georgia. There are 376 high schools in the state. Um, we were trying to find a way to get our material out there. In some of the courses we have uh, subscription models and copyright issues. So we understand the idea that taxpayers built these courses with state dollars and that we need to provide that material back to at a minimum our school districts but in a larger sense whoever we can provide the information to. But we had, we had these issues, uh, subscription and copyright being one, delivery, uh, server bandwidth, how can people, how can we serve that out effectively. So our first thing, and when I showed you the shared courses, what Tammy's group did is we said, okay, we have this material, school districts want it, most of it is teacher created, uh, the rest of the stuff is, is probably out there in the public domain, we didn't really go get a lot of copyrighted material. But we did have uh, subscri some subscription services. Uh, Discovery Education has a lot of videos that we used. And although every school in our state has a access to that, they're all individual licenses. So we had, to, we had to go in and physically pull that material out of the courses. So the shared courses, the, the list that you looked at, is a cleaned up course, but we had to pare it down some. We had to take some of the videos out. We had to take out some of the subscription pieces. And so we started thinking, well, how can we really move past that and really make the material so that when we create it for Georgia Virtual School, it's just available for everybody. and We don't have to spend the time remaking it and redoing that. So with some uh, guidance and encouragement from Dr. Clayton and our technology uh, director, uh, Bob Swigum, has kind of allowed us to, to really look at how we can use open educational resources. So what we have found is that the solution to all those issues is to use open educational resources in creating the courses. So um, this year we have a, a year-long development cycle. Uh, Tammy has worked with her development team. Uh, so all courses that started being uh, creation in July next fall will all be open educational resources. The whole course will be available and it will become uh, part of the shared resources that are on, on the list. So uh, the shared resources are there now, they're just not all OER. In the fall, the new 30 some odd courses, and we'll look at the list, um, will be there. Here's the list. So um, just because of the development cycle, we didn't go back and, and, and readdress the English, math, social studies. We just started where we were. Um, fortunately, we were also an RT3 state. So we, uh, part of the RT3 um, application required us to build 10 courses. And uh, through conversation, we, we want to use those dollars to build um, really good courses. So we looked at uh, the three last ones, the AP Calculus BC, AP Physics Mechanics, and AP Electrical. Um, very hard to find in a virtual school anywhere, a virtual high school anywhere. So those will be available next fall, the entire courses. Um, the tricky part with building AP courses that is that College Board does require a textbook for the course. So uh, we, we kind of got together to figure out, well, how can we do that? So those textbooks, uh, excuse me, those courses are being built textbook agnostic. They'll refer to your textbook in a certain area. 
But the material isn't going to say, go to chapter 4. It'll just say, go to a specific area. So the teacher, all the material in there will be OER material, but we have to have the textbook tied to the course, or, or we're not going to get through the audit. Um, the other courses on the list just happen to be what we were working on through development uh, this year. Actually, the food nutrition, the web design, those are also RT3 courses. So the last five on the list are probably going to be even a little bit more robust because there's, there's a bigger pot of money used to develop those. Um, but we're pretty proud of most of our courses, and we've been able to uh, include the courses. We'll go back eventually and start working on the core material to include uh, the, the mass, even though our state math is very different than most state maths. But the, the language arts and things like that, we'll be moving all of that to OER. But this is the list that we will have available fall. The procedure, the, the idea is that everything we build from now on will be built in, in the same manner. So we've, uh, we've worked with our developers, worked through some training, one of the reasons why we're here is to begin to learn even more so we can get access to more resources and, and finding those pieces and creating networks that will really help us make this piece grow. Um, and so this is, I, I took a couple screenshots of some of the courses and I have some course material that, that we can look at. So we have AP Physics and this is just a, a sample of the course. Um, the, the Moving Man Simulation is an OER product. Uh, all of our courses are lined up. We didn't change our uh, design process for this. So this is the same way that we've been developing courses for uh, several years. Just the material that we've chosen to use. Um, all of our courses are set up like this. And when you look at them in the shared resources, they'll look like this also. All the handouts associated with it are always found in the same place. Um, we will link out to other other resources outside of ours that may or may not be uh, open educational resources, but they'll be in the sidebar. Everything in the white pane will, will be OER material. Um, some of the material, like in this one, this is a teacher created jig. So we have a lot of material that we're not only going to be able to, um, that we're going to be gathering, but also a lot of material that we will be adding. To, uh, to OER material. So that, that will be there and, and certainly available. Everything will have a uh, CC BY license on it. And these are just really snapshots. This course is, this is one unit of the course and it's nowhere near uh, finished yet. So we can't really give you a link to go through this yet because we haven't had it reviewed or, or checked for accuracy. Um, but that is what they look like. They'll be orange, though, because we take everything and make it orange <laughs> when we share it. So just as a, it's the exact same thing, we just rebrand it in an orange background. So that is our, that would be the physics course. Um, and we also have, oh, my text right now, uh, management insurance is another course that we're working on right now. So we're not focusing strictly on core products. In academic areas, we're looking at elective areas as well, career. Uh, George's new superintendent is uh, very career oriented. So along with the academic product courses, we will also be offering and including a lot of career technical courses, which are a little hard to find out there now. Um, judging from, from what I've heard when we've been here, the, the K-12 piece of OER is, is really still very small. Um, when you're talking about AP courses, it's very easy to find the material. You just go to the college courses and find the freshman type material uh, for, out of higher ed, and that's very, very valuable. When you're tr getting K-12, the material is a little bit more difficult to find, and we're certainly working on that, but hopefully as we contribute and other schools begin to contribute, that pool of information will grow in all the areas that we have. So this would be the, the risk management class. Um, every, all the pieces come with it. We do some neat things with this, uh, we create module minutes. So um, a student can listen or read in one minute what the entire module is about. 
So uh, at the end of this eight-page eight module, probably uh, half a week's worth of work, uh, if, if they can't answer the questions in the module minute, then they know they're not ready for the test or if they don't understand that. So we include that. And it's kind of based on uh, Father Guido Sarducci's five-minute university. <laughs> so we thought the one-minute module. Here's what you really should learn by the end of this module. Um, and, and this is just, uh, you know, we, we include the PowerPoint presentations. We, um, we have a big emphasis on uh, making it multimedia, incorporating different types of, of material. And like I said, the handouts and things are on the side. So this is who we are. And wow, it's only been 17 minutes. That's pretty good. Um, uh, this is who we are. My name is Jay Heap. We all have the same email addresses, except there are different names. Um, Dr. Clayton may have some additional comments that she would like to make, or we'll, we certainly have uh, time for questions or, or comments that you have on how we can uh, really begin to participate uh, and provide material. Uh, we're going to spend the money to create it for our students anyhow. So why not provide that to everybody that we can? But uh, any comments that you have or any ideas or any pathways that you could provide to us that would be, help us be uh, successful, we would certainly appreciate that also. Uh, if you want to see uh, the live versions of any of those, the AP course, I, I have that available to see it. So, Dr. Clayton, do you have any... I'm interested in hearing from you all. You know, so this is sort of what we're doing. You know, there are lots of reasons, uh, as you've heard um, throughout the conference, of why you know the need, and especially we've asked a couple of questions uh, in the K-12 space as far as it not being widely, you know, a widely used practice. And and of course there are a lot of policy reasons. There's funding. There's all types of reasons we can talk about. But um, we really believe that um, we have a service to provide um, and a need to provide to our students and especially our teachers in the state uh, with dwindling budgets and um, we've got to figure out how to leverage the technology and leverage the resources through the funding. You know, Jay talked about the race to the top, uh, being able to offer, uh, offer those courses, um, really trying to grow the program and be able to support not only our teachers and parents in the state but certainly our students. Uh, moving forward. So please feel free to give us some feedback on what you're seeing. If you have questions, comments, we'd you know, love to hear from you all. But don't want to hold you up from lunch either. <laughs> are there other states that you can collaborate with that are doing the K-12 programs that you can... Utah! Yeah. Utah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm just figuring they're already in virtual K-12, um, right? Or is it just 9? Open high school. I know open high school 9 to 12, yeah. Um, IDLA, which is Idaho, okay. Idaho Digital Learning. Um, Montana Digital. Yeah, Montana. So we're, we're all part of a state virtual school sort of alliance. And uh, I know we have in the next two weeks the virtual school symposium where we're going to get together and sort of share. But I know Bob Curry in Montana and Cheryl Charlton in Idaho, uh, we're all sort of swirling in this pool and figuring out, okay, we don't want to duplicate efforts, certainly here's what we're putting out, you know, we should be collecting soon what they're working on, and we're hoping to, like Jay was saying, continue that community. Here's what we're putting out, let's see what you've got, how can we share and, you know, mobilize resources. So, um, if you're looking for that from a 9-12 perspective or even a K-12 perspective, Idaho and Montana might be good resources to go to as well. Yes, um, I'm Alana Harrington from Sailor.org, Jen Shoup and Cami Gardan, and we're so excited about what you're doing. I think this is really awesome. Um, if you get a chance, um, there might be some resources on Sailor.org that would be helpful in the creation of some of those um, advanced electives, like the AE Computer Science, Risk Management. We hear you, though, that the resources for those courses are really tough to find. Um, yes. So if we've done it at the college level, perhaps some of that material can be repurposed. That's what we're hoping. We're hoping yeah, we can find. And that's what we found. In some areas, freshman English 
is similar to 11th grade English. You just, it's the depth and the scope you have to watch. So a lot of the material is useful. The fact that it is open makes it even better because we can then create derivatives of that and make it what we need, uh, which we can't do with a lot of other materials. So we look, certainly look through the uh, available material. Uh, and we certainly, we didn't even, I didn't know who y'all were until I came here, which is the reason, you know, part of the reason we're very new at this, we're new in the neighborhood. Um, we feel very welcomed. Uh, we've had many doors opened uh, in the last couple days. Hopefully we have also opened our, our doors. Um, by no means are we even close to understanding the full <laughs> capacity of what, uh, what this neighborhood brings us. Um, but we certainly want to do our part and contribute, uh, especially to, to grow it in, our, in the not, 912 to start with, because that's where we focus. But we have all intention of uh, creating K-5 resources. We may never develop K-5 courses, may or may not, uh, but the resources piece. So as we even develop those, we may be looking at developing you know, K-5 open resources, which will really help. What license are you using as your open license? That's a tiny question. It's CC BY. Okay. And you're using SoftChalk for all of these? Yes. yes. Okay. Good job! Yay! <laughs> I am, uh, I'm from Connections, and, and now with the Shuttleworth Foundation doing a fellowship to try to make it easier to get content from place to place, and SoftChalk has been one of the partners that we've been really trying to figure out a leverage point to get uh, the ways to get things from SoftChalk into Connections and use that for remix and get it back out. This might be a perfect, there's a you know, really huge amount of content to drive that effort. I'd love to be well, we used soft chalk started about three years ago because we needed something. You know, we're not in the LMS business. We have an LMS that we, we buy. So um, we wanted it to be portable. And as we uh, wanted to give this to the school districts, their LMS may be totally different. They may use something different that we do. Or they may not use one at all because you could drive this right off a website. So that's why we went with soft chalk because of the packaging. It, it, we can move it fairly easily. Yeah, and I've, I've heard that it's really a good operating experience too. And it's, and it's very easy to use, which yeah. is, I mean, you know, I mean, and Tammy, Tammy's in that the development area more than I am anymore, but it's it's so much easier. And you know, we've had districts who tell us, um, especially our rural districts, where you know we wanted to build something and be able to share something you know, all to those and listen to our, our, you know, our districts that are saying, we have nothing. You know, we're lucky to have an interactive whiteboard. We're lucky to have a projector. We're lucky to just have a whiteboard that doesn't do anything at all. You know, uh, we're, I mean, there, there are situations that are like that in the state of Georgia, and I'm sure in other districts, obviously, around the country. But um, we wanted to be able to serve everybody, um, those that are saying, we, we just don't have anything to the big boys who were saying, yeah, we've got an LMS, give us your stuff, we can load it in and go. Yeah, yeah that's so, a really nice thing about the output from Sawtrack. Right. You can throw it anywhere on the web, or you can have it as an integral part of your equipment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we actually have, um, and you saw it briefly, we have the shared piece. We also have an e-source program that individual high schools in the state can subscribe. It's, it's, it's free. free. Um, How many districts do we have out of the 100? Well, we have 40, 42 schools, 42 subscribers. But they actually can have access to the package. So they can bring the whole package down. If they have soft chalk, they can manipulate it themselves. Mm -hmm. So, well, well, yeah, we don't necessarily recommend that they remove stuff because we've had good results with our material. Uh, our student success has been very good. Um, but they, they can do that. So even if it were to rebrand it, give it the school colors, change the discussions type of things, so that they can actually get the whole package. Were the English courses, were, it didn't seem like those were, were you going to say that the ones that are already on there will be OER or they already are OER? Those are not OER now. They're shared and available. Okay. But they're not necessarily all resources OER. And I'm assuming having just 
authored a, a course for English, one of my obstacles was running into the copyright. Mm -hmm. If you want to use anything that's OER, you have to use something before 1900s, yes. and that Gutenberg project kind of thing. So you're trying to, is that one of the obstacles that come with it? In those English that, classes yeah. specifically, yes. Okay. Yeah. Although the, the material, the critiques around that, right. could be OER. We don't provide right. the book to the student. We tell the student they have to go get to the library, get right. the book, or whatever. So that would still be an option. We'd still be able to use those materials uh, and you know, critiques and resources and reviews of those stories. But you know, you can't copy the story and stick it. In. Right. But, I mean, yeah. How do you deal with assessment? Well, we deal with it inside our LMS. Uh, in every package, though, we we do include. Uh, project-based assessments. Uh, there are, uh, if you just access the shared material, there are inline activities, so student self-assessment things. There are non-scored quizzes. The gradebook Dropbox submission piece is inside our LMS. And we're trying to figure out a way, uh, that not only do the school systems want our material, they want our assessments also. But we're trying to keep the integrity of our test questions. If our test questions get out there, then... So we're actually looking at possibly revising all of our questions within our program, providing the old questions uh, in a bank. But questions don't move nearly as well as content between learning management systems. Even though they say they do, they, they don't. <laughs> Yes, sir. The way a textbook publisher would normally handle that is anybody can get the student edition, but in order to get access to the assessments of things, I have to contact you and somehow have to verify that I'm a teacher. Right. So, you know, if, if I could email you from my email address at a school in Georgia and say, what, could, could you send me the assessments? Is that the kind of thing you'd be willing to do privately to share? Well, the, the problem is we, we build the, t the test banks inside of our LMS. And we've, we've had very, we move it between classes, we move it within the LMS, to pull that piece out. Uh, we haven't found a good tool to do it, because um, we have some Moodle instances that we would like to be able to put some of these questions in. Um, if the question has a picture or an equation, it loses it. Uh, you can get the raw text and the multiple choice pieces, but we've been unsuccessful um, yeah, no, trying no to do that. standards are still really right. <laughs> and we've, I think through, through our going out in the state, the schools are very happy with the content and the teachers kind of want to create their own assessment piece. Um, and I think that's where we're starting in our state, very useful because we don't want the teachers just to say, here it is and I'm never going to look at it because I have all the pieces. And if they have to create the assessment, then we knew they had to go through the content piece in order to be able to do that. So, uh, we would like to provide some guidance in the test bank piece, but we haven't gotten there yet. And Christina has... No, I was saying that they were letting us know. Oh, I'm done. I'm done. We'll be, we'll be here. You know, we're about to go have lunch. We sit at that table way in the back, on the right. We got black shirts, so feel free to drop by. Thank you.